Awesome, Tyler. I'm so excited to talk to you. Uh, I know that you have this amazing podcast called Middle Class Money, which talks about pretty much how to create wealth for the middle class. I know you go into budgeting, real estate, you know, all sorts of stuff. But what I love most about this is you actually have a nine to five. Yeah. Um, you're not like a lot of the people that I talk to who are trying to make it online. You have your nine to five and then you are also doing the whole online side hustle business. So can you uh, tell us a little bit more about your backstory, Tyler, and kind of uh, how everything came about? Yeah. So I'm 30 years old. Um, you know, I work in business to business sales. I've been in sales, gosh, really since I graduated. I, I had a brief stint at Target as a manager and I quit after three months. I went to school <laughs> for four years to realize in three months that, you know, that just wasn't for me. Um, so, and then ever since then, I've kind of always been dabbling in starting businesses. I've done e-commerce with Amazon um, that did well. I was able to pay off like $50,000 in student debt um, when we were awesome. newly married. Um, I've done, you know, multifamily real estate that we're invested in. And then uh, also had like a local auto detail business that did really well that I was able to sell a couple years ago. Um, and now I, I do business to business sales for, uh, I sell high end analytic cameras to commercial businesses. Think of like, uh, what you'd see in a stadium or a sporting arena or when you go to a concert, things like that. Um, and then I also have middle-class money on the side where I teach people how to manage their money well. And then hopefully eventually if you do that, it sets you up to, you know, to be able to chase your dreams in, in the long run. So, and what what are your dreams right now? I know you have your middle class, your not your middle class, your nine to five. Yeah. But I, I know we kind of briefed on it earlier. But uh, tell us a little bit what you're trying to accomplish. And I know that your podcast has like 248 five star reviews. So if you definitely haven't checked out his podcast, go ahead and like and subscribe right now. But uh, go ahead and tell us like kind of what your goals are. Yeah. So I'll I'll twist the screen. You probably can't see it, but there's all my goals just for this year. Um, I have a huge four by eight whiteboard in my my. Uh, office that I, um, man, I always love to write stuff down. It holds me accountable. It keeps me motivated. Uh, but yeah, I would say the goal is to eventually one day be able to help people understand, um, the things that I, the missteps that I took and some of my business failures, I've had more failures than I've <laughs> had successes. Um, that, and then also just encouraging people to, to manage their money well in order, in order to do that. So what I mean by that is for instance, if we would not have structured our lifestyle and budget the way we we did my wife never would have the chance to go into real estate um, she made negative five thousand dollars her first year in real estate uh -huh, but i wouldn't let her quit because i knew she right. loved it um had we not um been disciplined with our money she never would have got to chase her dream and now seven years she's she's the, so successful at 28 years old that you know more success than than most real estate agents will have in a lifetime um and it all started with just simply manage your money well. So if I can give people the steps to do that and allow them to chase their dreams, then that's really my dream. That's that's awesome. I know you said you've had a lot of uh, failures, but you've talked about how you've had some successes in your detailing business, e-commerce. I think for a lot of people, um, probably everyone, we've all had more failures than successes because I mean, that's just the, the game of life. Like you're gonna pick yourself up from those failures. And once you get that success, you, um, it's like that one thing you celebrate. And um, I think a lot of people too much dwell on the, the con not the consequences, but the failures, the mishaps, or the learning opportunities, instead of uh, actually embracing their successes. Um, it's, it's crazy. I, I wanna get on a topic real quick about what you've been talking about, budgeting. I think that so many people focus on making money and they don't focus on like the defensive part of their money. Uh, money strategy. Uh, what is some of the, I mean, I know of the 50, 20, 30 rule or the 50, 30, 20 just depends on how you flip it. What are some kind of tactics that you use or rules of thumb that uh, you find that are best for uh, helping people budget? Yeah. So we're a little bit uh, different, probably I kind of made up my own strategy per se, That's fine. but, but essentially is the way I like to think of it is flipping the budget upside down on its head. So if everyone can imagine, if you've ever made a budget, um, regardless of whether you stuck to it or not, just think about when you made a budget. The first thing you did was wrote down your rent or mortgage, right? Because that's right. the most expensive. And then you probably wrote down your car payment. Right. Um, but inherently, those things are actually the least important. And 
and those are actually the one of the few things that you control. So is what I like to teach is um, putting those pri- learning how to prioritize a budget um, and actually learning how much let's look at even if you're 20 early 30s, let's look at how much you need to retire what you want to retire at um, and stop thinking it um, as of an age and think of it more of as a number. So if I can get you to think of, hey, I need 1.5 million or 2 million to retire. Well, maybe we can reach that number by 45. And so we put that number towards that investment at the very top of our priority in our budget and then make sure all our other categories fit, if that makes sense. I love that. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of the the concept of paying yourself first mm-hmm. versus, um, you know, a lot of people where they pay for all their expenses first. They uh, a lot. And this is a very great strategy, by the way, Tyler, as the most successful people in business and uh, just net worth always pay themselves first. Um, because it's money's worth now more now than it is in the future, just with inflation. So it's super important to uh, keep reinvesting your money. What it, I mean, do you have a? Is that just keep it in the savings account? Should I just keep 1.5 million in my my bank and hope that I'm going to be uh, retired early? Or how, what is what is that strategy like? For yeah, you? that's that's a great question. Um, I try and keep it very simple, and I, and. What I've realized from chatting with people is they get so hung up on um, where it should be or like what stock, right, or or large cap and all these different things that, to be honest, they have no business really going into the details of. Um, So I try and keep it simple and just say, hey, listen, if you can take your employer's match, right, let's say it's 3% and you make about 50 grand a year with an average U.S. salary, give or take some money, um, if you take that match, if you max out your Roth IRA, which is $6,000 a year, and if you're eligible for an HSA, which um, I think is like thirty-seven fifty, I think for a single or 7000 for family. And that's a health savings account for those that don't know. Yeah. And if you don't have that, then then you can skip that and go straight to like a low in, index fund or real estate, like in your case. Yeah. Um, but if you just max out those three accounts and, and never touch real estate or never touch the open, like a, a joint account market. Um, I think if you start in your early twenties, you'll be a millionaire by the time you're 50. I mean, and that's just by maxing out your tax advantage accounts. But, you know, part of my mission to go back to your earlier question is no one taught me that. And so I really did have about 40 to 50 grand sitting in a savings account when I was 27 years old, because I had this passion to make money and save. Right. No one ever. And and it's kind of my fault too. Uh, no one ever told me, hey, maybe you should max out a Roth, Roth IRA. I had no clue what that was. I didn't have a financial advisor. I thought you had to be rich to have a financial advisor. <laughs> um, right. So I'm just trying to educate people of like, hey, just by doing little discipline steps, you know, you can be very, very wealthy um, and give yourself a lot of power and negotiation power too. Yeah. And I, I think it's a smart, I, I don't know if you said this or not, but uh, you had 50000 in your bank. And then you obviously reinvested the money to have your money working for you yeah. with the cost of inflation uh, and how banks work. Just keeping the money in your bank, uh, like a savings account or even in under your mattress, like you're going to be losing money every single day just because of inflation and uh, the way the banks make money. And this is amazing. And I don't know if people know this, but um, they make money on like five or six different ways. <clears throat> They make money by loaning me money so that I can invest it into real estate. Um, they loan it to, they give um, you know credit cards and all that stuff. They invest into the stock market. They charge you fees. So they use all this um, money or arbitrage on interest rates. And if they're able to give you 0.01% while charging me 3%, they're making the difference on that interest, which is amazing. Um, I, I, at some point, I want to be the bank because... You know, you can charge fees, you can charge interest, you can invest other people's money to make more money. It's just, it's, it's amazing. But I think that, go ahead. No, I say, yeah, one of the things that we can do is I can send you over some links that we can put. I know we'll, we'll work on an article kind of content piece, put together of, of where they should put like, you know, kind of that funnel of per se, right? The emergency fund is first. Where should we right. put that? Cause we don't want that sitting in your local bank. Cause it's going to get 0.002% right. and not do any, got any, any work. So, um, put it in a, an account that's at least going to get you maybe one point five to two percent interest, and and then we'll get more aggressive from there. So we can we can work on that. Yeah, and there's all sorts of different ways, right? You can 
uh, do a ladder with a CD and have a CD ladder. There's so many different ways. It obviously, depends on your risk tolerance and depends on uh, how liquid how liquid you need to be. I need to have a substantial amount of money sitting in my bank account because obviously with uh, real estate, I need reserves and any bank is going to want those reserves in my bank. There's nothing I can do, but unfortunately it just sits in there. Um, so I think that is smart that you are taking steps to invest in money. I actually don't invest. Uh, I think I have like an acorn stock uh, or account and that's all the, the money I invest into the stock market. Um, for me, my wife does that. She has her matching 401ks. She has all that because I don't get the, the employee contributions like you guys do. So, I mean, I think it's so funny that so many entrepreneurs or uh, infopreneurs or fake entrepreneurs uh, shit on the nine to five all the time, but they, they don't get matching contributions. They don't get medical benefits. They don't get maternity leave. They don't get dental and vision. They don't get all these great benefits that the nine to five have. But I think that what I love about you and your podcast and what you teach is that people kind of have a cap of how much they can make with uh, a nine to five and people like who are willing to put in the extra effort and be um, someone who does not want to work all their life uh, will take a side hustle or uh, re reinvest into real estate like your wife does. Um, so I think that's really cool. What side hustles do you recommend for people that um, – are do have a nine to five that you know aren't going to be drained uh you know after the work yeah and we'll have a great sleep schedule and all that oh man so th that's tough so it obviously depends on your stage of life so just to paint a picture right now uh, right now i have a side hustle right with the podcast right. and it really it's more about building value and, and we'll worry about the money later because i do have a nine to five so i don't really have to worry about that but you know just to paint a picture for, for those listening i have two little kids uh, I'm a wife. So I get up at four 30 in the morning and I have about three hours that I get to work on podcast stuff. Right. And then I go to work <laughs> right? and, and I, I have to sell cameras and access control and the whole nine yards. Um, and do, you know, then from there I get pick up my kids and, you know, got to make sure they have a dad and, and hang out with them, play with them in the yard. And then obviously got it sometime after that, we'll put the kids to bed have to spend time with the wife. So, um, for me, time with the wife. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, I have those three hours in the morning. If I was not able to get up with two kids and a full-time job, I wouldn't have time. That right. looked a lot different when I was 23 years old. I had so much time. My wife is like, yeah, go do something. You're bugging me. Like, ah. <laughs> um, so to answer your question, it depends, man, cause there's so many answers and I know there's so many people that are successful with different things. I look at three platforms and I actually, our, our episode touched on this a little bit yesterday, but three platforms. Um, one, are you going to be a local service provider? To me, that's the, that's the easiest, right? Yeah. Um, on the local standpoint, so many people aren't taking advantage of, um, right. Local SEO, Google maps, Google reviews. I really think in a small, small town, um, even a medium sized town, you could go in an industry in six to 12 months, rack up enough reviews and referrals to really make a dent. No matter if you're a power washer, an auto detailer, a photographer, whatever the case may be, real estate agent. Um, just cause to be honest, the competition's not as steep. Now it's different if you're in Chicago, LA, right? Dallas right. competition is a little bit different, but still, um, and then secondly, are you going to be like a freelancer? Like, are you going to sell on Etsy or Fiverr, things like that? I would, if you were going to do that, I'd focus really on understanding the platform you're selling on. And then lastly, it's the, huge. Yeah, it's very huge. Yeah. And then lastly, the big behemoth, obviously, is just selling strictly online. Um, obviously the biggest reward, but huge competition. I mean, you're competing with the big dogs. Google doesn't care how hard you work. I mean, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, there, there's certain things that they look for. And if you're not meeting them, you're not going to rank up there with whatever product category, you know, if you're trying to beat out Nike or apparel or whatever the case may be, you know, Google is going to favor how it plays ball. So, you know, specific examples, I, I would figure out what platform you're going to sell local freelance or online, and then really understand your market and make sure that you're passionate about your hobby. Um, otherwise you're going to burn out. Yeah, I love that you just said that because um, I was actually going to ask you, have you ever felt burnout? Because like when I, so before this, I was a personal trainer. I uh, was local. I was actually in a very highly um, 
I was in Orange County, California, very um, dense market for personal trainers, obviously near San Diego, near the beach. So obviously everyone cares about fitness. Um, so luckily I did really well just because I niched my industry down and I had a particular group of people that I worked with. And by the end, I mean, I was working kind of like your schedule. Uh, I would wake up at four o'clock in the morning. Uh, I would train typically if I had a 4.30 or five client, rush over to the gym, go get there around 12 uh, or finish around noon, ha have my lunch, work out, and then go back at two because or two or three because I had a teacher who I trained, and then go till eight, and that was just draining on myself. So I think it's super important to be passionate about what you do. By the end of it, I was not passionate about it. I made a lot of money. I invested in real estate, and I was tired of exchanging time for money. Um, and I think that's where a lot of us are trying to now escape from, or a lot of our listeners actually trying to escape from uh, the rat race or the digital rat race. And I think that's, you know, someone like you who can show people that, you know, a nine to five isn't the worst thing and you can actually use it to your advantage Why by, you know, leveraging uh, employee contributions, all the benefits. And, you know, that's stuff that, that, is, wow, that is stuff that doesn't come out of your pocket. And you're able to now use your budgeting tactics to reinvest into income producing assets or, you know, other businesses or whatever that is to be able to retire early. Is that kind of the yeah the gambit? Yeah, I, I would say 100%. You know, we kind of, my wife and I use our base salaries to live off of, and then um, we're blessed enough to both receive, you know, good sized commissions every once in a while. So her being in real estate and me in sales. So that's essentially our play money of, of do we want to invest it? Do we want to invest in our side hustles? Um, but we had a, a lot of hard work on the front end of making sure that budget is correct. And then making a budget's easy. It's sticking to it is hard. So we have a lot of tools and, and tricks. I wouldn't say tricks. They're more of just like almost like psychological, just like parameters that we put in. Um, like we like, for instance, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. So for instance, like um, a lot of people think of budget as very constricting. So one of the ways that we do to, to lift that is we both have a prepaid spending card um, that oh, she right. gets X amount of dollars a month to spend. And I get X amount of dollars to spend. It's very, it started out at $25 a month and now it's, quite a bit higher, but she can go spend that on whatever she wants. And I don't know about it. It is, I can't say she can't in the same way here. So, and we've put that into the budget. So, um, it, it's just ingrained in, so it's not like, Hey, live this, you know, water and rice ramen noodle yeah. kind of life. <laughs> it's just make sure you're, you're accounting for it and then put the parameters in place that if I try and swipe my card, when my $200 a month is gone, it's going to get declined. And if I swipe the other card, my wife is going to get a notification. Right. <laughs> um, so little things like that of, you know, just, just trying to be smart and disciplined and, and go that route. I love that you have the prepaid card. I think that's really cool concept because um, one, if it does decline, you're kind of embarrassed. So it kind of is a psychological play of like kind of reward versus um, consequences um, because how embarrassing is it to go? So I, I'm, I don't think I've ever had this happen, but to go, so I can only imagine swiping a card and it declining, and you'd be like, "Well, I mean, oh yeah, it's, it's like happened. Time. Yeah, it's happened multiple times. And the thing is, we have an app that I could look, but right. you know, you know, you get close, and you're like, oh, I think I have a couple of bucks left, so I'm gonna go grab a coffee or whatever. And then you swipe, and it's like, oh, it didn't go through. You're like, oh, really? Well, let me just try a different <laughs> card. I mean, every month for me, I do it all the time because I'm too lazy to check the app because we're human. Right? right. And if that was my credit card, guess what? I just would swipe it, you know? Right. And so you, you would never, and that's how we end up, you know, I always make uh, people, the very first thing we, we do when we sit down and make a budget is make a budget. And then after that, I have them go pull the expenses from last month, their credit card and bank statements. And they're never even close on budget. Their paper, oh, they're on right. paper, their budget looks great. Their expenses oh. are like 30%, 40% over. And they're like, Oh yeah, I did buy that. Oh yeah, I did get that, right? <laughs> yeah. And um, it's it's funny because you don't really think about it. Like it's just kind of automatic that you don't realize how much you are actually spending until you write a budget. I mean, I look at things or and a lot of people forget that they have like uh, subscriptions or whatever else attached to their account and it just comes out and have no idea that it's coming out every month. I mean, there's millions of things that I'm sure I'm subscribed to and I just have not uh remove them. And I know there's a, and I'll link it in the show notes, but a uh, app called Truebill, 
which uh, removes a lot of subscriptions, um, stuff that is kind of a, an app that's kind of useful for budgeting in a sense. They're not really budgeting, but more canceling all the things that you really don't need or asking to have them lower like a phone bill, insurance, that sort of thing. So it's a pretty cool uh, app, I think. Um, I was going to ask you, so do you, and I saw this on your podcast, but do you guys share your guys' expenses as uh, a married couple? We do. We do. Um, and it's so weird to us because we've just always operated that way. That's why her parents did and my parents did. So when we found out people didn't that were married, we were like, our minds were blown. And the people that didn't share finances that found out we did, they were like, wait, you do that? Like, it's so opposite because right. you never talk about it. You just do what your parents did most likely right? Or, or whatever you were, you know, ingrained in that nature uh, that you were taught. And that's just normal. And I've seen both of them work. I obviously am a proponent of us being on the same goal. Now I'm more, way more of a nerd. And like, I'm the one that actually invests the money and, and sets it all up and makes the budget. But right. She's a hundred percent involved in how much we spend in each category and things like that. For us, that works. Um, I know for some people it doesn't, you know, if you ask my opinion, the, from what I've seen, the percentage of people that are um, able to be wealthier for us, it, it accelerates in, in my experience, percentage wise, we'll just go just by straight percentage wise. The people that share money are able to accelerate their wealth faster. If that makes sense. No, no, no. Yeah. So I've seen people that don't share finances that just crush it, right? They do great. They each have their own mission. They're very, you know, a type people and, and they're crushing it. Um, but more times than not statistics would say you can grow faster if you share, if you combine them. Yeah, I think it, it, and it, but it depends on, I think your, like you said, you guys both share the same goals, right? It's like right. if one was not as frugal as you say your wife was not the frugal one um and you were and she spent all the money and you saved it all it'd be kind of working against each other right. so um and i was just listening to a uh, million millionaire next door and they talked about uh, you know how that relationship works with uh one person being frugal and the other person not versus two people that share the kind of the same goal like you're saying and how they are able to accelerate their wealth so quickly because they do share expenses and they do have the same alignment on where they want to take their lives so i think that's really cool me and my wife actually don't share expenses yeah. um we have separate uh, accounts um so totally different uh things um but we're getting to the point where i think we are sharing uh, our expenses. She actually, we just refinanced all of our properties or just refinanced the first one to leverage the other three. And she's has her name on every single property. So, um, or will have her name on every single property. So, um, it, it does, it does, it is super important to have that kind of shared, uh, mindset of where you guys want to go and, uh, where you want to be in the future. I know for me, I do not want to work past like 40, 45. Um, and my goal is to make enough income through real estate investing or uh, software development to make sure she doesn't have to work. So that's kind of uh, our alignment. And I know we were just talking about this earlier about how um, you guys could stop working or you could stop working because you have your side hustle um, and you're able to grow it to a point where at some point you won't have to quote unquote work a nine to five. You'll be able to free up your time and uh, no longer exchange time for money because you have uh, your investments, you have your podcast, and you have all these other streams of income that help you uh, produce more income. What is what is kind of your, I guess, number that you guys focus on on, on retirement? Like what is that uh, perfect number, I guess? Yeah, so I'll kind of back up just a tad. So essentially, you know, if, and this, like I said, for, it makes sense for some people and it doesn't for others. But for instance, had we not shared finances, my wife would, like we talked about before the call, my wife never would have been in real estate because right. you know she was 23 years old. And the only way that she could have chased that dream um, is if I, you know, take, took care of all the expenses for until she started making money, which right. I kind of joked, she made negative $5,000 that first year, which is no joke. Uh, literally did not make a sale and had office fees um, when we were in Hawaii, which are not cheap. No. Um, so yeah, that, 
holding costs, you have marketing, you have yeah. uh, just continued education. There's so much that goes into real estate and uh, being a realtor. Um, so sorry for interrupting you. So, but yeah, that's why that negative uh, income happened. Yeah. So, yeah. So just had we not had that framework, you know, she'd probably work in a nine to five somewhere and, and probably miserable. Who knows? I don't know. Just with her personality. I know for some people it's great. Um, I, but you know, I'm, I'm a nine to five. I love my job. Um, I also love my side hustle, but going to your point of what is that number? What does that look like? Um, you know, if you look at like simple path to wealth, um, or a lot of the, the fun, you know, fire guys, the right. uh, financial independent retire early, right. they would say a good rule of thumb is 25 times what you're spending now with and investing in that and 75 to 80% stocks, 25% bonds. Um, I'm more like you, like real estate. Um, we have a couple or involved in a couple multifamily properties. Um, that's kind of, I think just as safe as bonds, if not, and with a higher return, in right. my oh, opinion. Way, way better. Yeah. So for us, um, you know, I'd like a couple million. Um, you know, I, I'm 30. My wife is 28. If we could be retired by the time the kids are on to college, which would put us at 48 and 46, um, I, I would be extremely happy. I think we're on pace to to do it faster than that. That's great. Um, but, you know, you know, for us, it's just each month it takes time, you know, you can set up automatic payments, but for us, we get commission, you know, same with you, your returns on your investment are not the same every month. So no. you're going to have to go in there and every month you're going to have to take the time to say, okay, I made X, Y, Z. I made an extra grand or two this month. Where am I going to put it? Am I going to spend it or do I want to retire a little earlier? And you got to make that conscious decision every single month and every week, every time you do that. And um, you know, that's what I'm just trying to teach people. If, if you can get in a habit of, of doing that and paying yourself first, um, you can still live a great life with a lot of nice things and retire early. It's not, it doesn't have to be this or that. It can be both in moderation. Yeah, definitely. I, I totally agree. And I think that uh, one of the things that I find that you talk a lot on is being, we're usually budgeting or being frugal. And I think a lot of people don't do that. And especially online, I've noticed that a lot is they'll make some start, sort of, I think any middle class American or anybody in general typically does this. The more money they make, the more they tend to spend. And um, they constantly are in this rat race because the more money they make, the more expenses they have, and they keep living paycheck to paycheck. And I think that the number one takeaway that a lot of people should take from this podcast is try and be more frugal, try and create the gap between what your expenses are and what your income is and using all that cash flow to reinvest into income producing assets. I mean, you guys have real estate, we have real estate. We're, we're always focused on um, reinvesting our money and paying ourselves first. For me, I, I don't focus on uh, like a grand number, like one, like a couple million. I'm more focused on how many rental properties I can get yeah. um, because at some point, um, you know, I could sell them. Off. I mean, there's so many different ways I could do it, right? Like I could sell those off uh, and just have a couple million and then have recurring income too so that I can continuously have my living expenses paid for through recurring income. And that's all I focus on is how much recurring income I have for this month and has it grown. Um, because if I can continuously grow my recurring income, then I, I have a safety net in a sense because I know each month that safety net is going to pay for all my expenses. It's going to allow me to reinvest my income into produ uh, income producing assets. And I, I'm i not like at a zero sum where once that couple million is gone, uh, I'm shit out of luck because I have no more money coming in. So that's why I, I heavily focus on uh uh, recurring income, but more importantly, why I invest in real estate is because like you said, with bonds, there's a lot, only really just a appreciation that you get from that versus real estate. Obviously you know this, but, and for those who don't, I mean, there's so many ways that you do get income from real estate. I mean, I get it through appreciation. I get it through depreciation. I get it through tax benefits. I get cash flow. I get debt pay down. I get creative financing. We were able to buy our dream house because I'm able to leverage the equity in our real estate properties and do an equity transfer or just cash out refi and buy our dream home for 20% down without spending any money out of, our, out of our pockets. So it just allows for so much 
wealth generation, I guess. And um, I think that's so great that you guys are investing in real estate already. And I think that, you know, I'm, and I know you guys have your um, budgeting uh, spreadsheet. Uh, the, the, what was it? God, it was on your website. I just talked about it to you about it ago. But tell us a little bit more about what that is on your website that people can actually get to start budgeting and start setting budgets to help their uh, middle class lifestyle. Yeah. So, I mean, the easiest thing for, for someone getting started, I would say is just go to our website, you pop in your email, it's free. You'll get kicked back a, uh, like a kind of financial checklist. Um, and then you'll get a spreadsheet. Um, hopefully the spreadsheet in and of itself will get you started. Um, you know, we have a full in-depth course that, that they can get and really walks them through like the whole nine yards of That's perfect, yeah. budgeting all the way to the end of investing. Um, but really, I would just say more important than the course is just get the budget and make one and, and start there and actually track your expenses. Um, you know, th that's more important, I think, than anything. If you can start there, the biggest thing that I, I see with people is they get overwhelmed um, with investing in real estate and trying to learn all of it, and they never take the first step. So right. I tell people, like, hey, don't even look at anything. Don't even buy the course. I mean, I don't care about any of that. Just take the spreadsheet, make a budget. And then track your expenses. And then step after that is like you kind of talked about. I call it ground zero, where you cancel all your subscriptions for one month. And you see after that one month what you want to add back in. Because I guarantee you won't add it all back in. So yeah. You're going to add some things back in. Um, but yeah, cancel everything. Cancel Netflix. Cancel Amazon Prime. I mean, you know, just do it. They'll take your money when you're ready to sign back up. Trust me. Right. You know? <laughs> um, no, it's true. And, and not only that, but it's... It's things that are not, most of the time, a lot of the, the recurring or subscription models are just distractions. Yeah. Um, like you said, Netflix, Amazon, streaming, anything streaming, is just a distraction to take you away from what you should be yeah. doing, which is uh, investing your time now into uh, your side hustle like you're doing, starting a podcast. Um, actually, I want to go back to, uh, real quick about, yeah. I kind of answered my question when I asked you, but... Have you ever been burnt out on, uh, you know, doing what you're doing? I mean, I think that's kind of a, a thing that happens to a lot of online uh, people, uh, especially people that are doing like organic or affiliate marketing or anything like that. Uh, do you ever feel built, uh, burnt out? Yeah, that's a great question. So, yeah, I, I kind of dodged that question earlier, didn't I? Um, <laughs> I think I just talked too much. So, yes, um, that's the reason why I sold my, my car detailing business. Um, it was a lot of hard work. Uh, went from you know zero to four employees in a matter of a couple months, and had a shop. And it, it, revenue was good, uh, especially for being early twenties. But I, I, I'll just be honest. I don't love cleaning cars. You know, back, <laughs> to your, back to your side hustle thing of ideas. Anyone can learn how to detail a car. I mean, I, I'll actually I'm in the process of writing kind of an in depth thing because people ask about that all the time, and that's one thing I know very well. Um, and it doesn't take a whole lot of money to be able to like start up money, a couple hundred bucks, you know, and you can have all the stuff you need to start cleaning people's cars. But yeah, that was one of the instances where I was just, I was, I was done. I was exhausted. I had a newborn. Um, I felt like I was babysitting my employees as well as trying to detail, you know, 20 some cars a week. And um, yeah, I just walked away one week and, and had I not, you know, and, and this is coming from someone whose net worth was like 30 grand, right? I, I, I didn't have a whole lot of money, but I also didn't have any debt and right. we were able to live off Becca's, my wife's money. So even just having that 30 grand in the bank and being debt free, um, that allowed me to say, I'm done. And I, and I literally, I went and found someone, I found another detail shop. I sold off uh, the business and all the accounts, the website, everything, just gave him a nice little pretty package that I know he's still benefiting from today. And I went and played golf for a month and I couldn't, I couldn't afford to do that for very long. Right. right? Um, you know, me, I wanted to start something new and get, and that's when I started essentially my business to business sales career. And I've been in it ever since. Um, but yeah, I, I was so burnt out. And I think it's because I wasn't passionate about detailing cars. I needed money and I was a hustler, but I didn't, I didn't care how clean your car was. I just needed a, a way to make money. And so I right. did it. <laughs> no, I, it sounds like a similar story to me. Like I was training for 10 years. 
I was very passionate in the very beginning. I was making lots of money. And um, by the end of it, uh, and I think that kind of is important uh, little piece of nugget that you were talking about is you had that 30,000, which was like that nest egg to kind of support you and you didn't have any debt. So when I got into, when I was finishing personal training and I was not in love with it anymore, I, um, one, my clients could tell because I just wasn't in it as much as I wanted to be. Um, I just wasn't showing my passion anymore. Um, but I didn't have any debt at that point. I, uh, we just refinanced the property. We pulled out a hundred thousand um, dollars. I paid off all my debts. And then I used that money to buy another real estate investment. And then I uh, gave my six figure business to a, uh, another personal trainer. I think he recently actually just proposed to his uh, girlfriend. So now he has a wife or a fiance, which is really exciting. And I went to Burning Man for a week. And then from there I moved to Texas and that's where we live now and started all over um, doing the whole online thing. And um, it's been great. So that kind of those real estate investments has allowed me to kind of live without debt or pay for all my expenses while I built another business. And that's kind of what you or, I mean, you didn't build another business or you do with your middle class pot uh, money, but you started another business that you're kind of excited about, not to start, but that you're involved with the nine to five now. So I think that's different kind of trajectory, but kind of same kind of mindset. I think that's really cool. Yeah. And, and I want to point out too, because a lot of people, um, like my my brother has said this so i can i can say this um you know he's like oh well you can do that because you know you you make more money right or, or you you had thirty thousand. but people don't realize is that combined for a couple years we combined we didn't make over 100 grand together but because like, because we didn't we spent so little and we were you know most people instead of having 30 grand in the bank they would they had just a new car or a bigger house i mean right um and so it's easy now to say, oh, well, yeah, because you have more money or you make more money. But they don't realize there was five to seven years where all our friends had the nicer things. I right. still have nicer cars. I drive a 12-year-old car, right? And probably have a net worth bigger than, than most people my age. And yet I have a $9,000 car that has 190,000 miles on it. Could I go afford a new one? Yes, but those aren't my priorities, right. right? It has to do with someday will I hopefully buy a really nice car? Yes, it's just right now it doesn't align with my goals. And I think right. you got to take time to write them down um, and, and, and do that because you have so many people out there who live in 80 to 90% of their income is spent every month. And right now you're seeing, unfortunately, it's, it's sad that a lot of people are hurting from it because they're losing their job and getting furloughed. My wife was furloughed actually. Uh -huh. um, she long story, but she, somehow she was in the corporate world for like six months. Um, and got furloughed and went back to real estate. But luckily, you know, we were okay for a little while be because of that. It's just, it gives you, I always say it just gives you power. It gives you options, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, have a, I work from home, so I never drive. I actually have a Prius that's completely paid off. Um, I actually rent it out on Toro, uh, and it gets like $500 extra a month um, added with our real estate. There's another eight grand. A nine grand and then obviously software is another couple grand so it just it all adds up and like you said like i my priority isn't to impress other people with materialistic things like i don't care i wear the same exact stuff pretty much all the time and i have the same car we have a super discount on rent because um my wife is a property manager and so all these things allow me to reinvest my money and I, I don't like my wife actually has to go out and buy me stuff because she's like, you need new stuff. Like, sure. and it's just, for me, it's, it's not a necessity. I'd rather have multi-generational wealth and I'd rather have like when we have kids um, to have them set up so that they don't have to worry about, you know, if, if, if they were going to college or not. Um, my goal is to kind of what, um, Brandon Turner did was buy his uh, son or daughter a fourplex when they're born. And then when they turn 18, obviously put like on 15 year mortgage, uh, when they're ready to go to college, they can decide to either rent it out and collect the income from it or sell it and go to college. And that's mm -hmm. kind of what my goal is uh, for our real estate investment. But my, I, I want to buy a hundred properties, like I said, so four out of a hundred is not going to hurt me. Yeah, no, that's awesome. That's to me, that's way more valuable than a, a 529, right? You get a little tax 
break on the 529, but you know, unfortunately that so many kids get handed their 529, which are great things that their parents set up for them, but they're never taught how to manage money. You know, same right. thing with me. My parents are great. I, I love my parents. Um, super close with them, but no one taught them. And and so in return, they didn't teach me that they didn't know it wasn't. Um, and we just don't talk about early money in, in our family homes. You know, it's just, it, it's interesting to me. It, it blows my mind that um, it's not more of a, a staple, you know? So. Yeah. I think that's, I, I see that online all the time, actually. And I see that in just general. I, I think I asked someone the other day about, you know, how much commissions do they make for um, uh, an affiliate sale? Because I was interested in the program. And he's like, are we talking about money in that? And I was like, I'm sorry. Like, do I do, do, do is that like a foreign subject or something? Like I would be, proud of, uh, you know, my accomplishments. And that's just me, but obviously not everyone's the same. I actually did not learn uh, money from my parents at all, kind of like you. Um, but my mom started investing, I think, she, I don't know who got their property first, um, but I ended up surpassing my mom. And now she comes to me and talks to me about investing. And now she wants to invest money with me to buy more real estate. So I think it's really cool when you can um, talk to your family about money and your friends and you know about how money works and what money does. And, and it's not, I think it's, it's so a taboo subject because people think of it as currency or a, a way to spend money versus a tool that allows us to do things faster. Yeah, um, here, here, here's what I, here's what I always tell people. It's funny because you're right. People don't like to say how much they make. People are very uncomfortable telling you how much they get paid, but guess what? They're not uncomfortable pulling up in the brand new Range Rover. They want to show right. that. They want to show that off, right? Right. We'll tell you how much you paid for it. Oh yeah, I just just got this, and it was. I mean, this is the top of the line. This was eighty grand, but yeah, they're really uncomfortable telling you how much they get paid. And so it's like, it just kind of when you think of it that way, it just brings a light. Is like money is just a, a vehicle to you know, it, it's nothing else. It's just a way to acquire things and ways right. to, to build wealth. It's just something we trade it's a promissory note yeah. is what it is it's i promise that this item is valued at this much and i'm going to give you this currency or this promissory note of this wealth and that's it's a tool is what it is and yeah. or a vehicle like you said and i think that's a great example of and i love that analogy of like you just said of people will drive up with a range rover go on these extrava um these great vacations and uh, show pictures about it and but won't talk about money so it's just it's a very interesting uh tab subject but so uh i know we talked a little bit about your uh website your podcast um where people can find out um middleclassmoney.com to sign up for that spreadsheet i know you have a course that teaches people how to um budget and save and take control of their money where can people find out more about taylor though so probably um, about me. So you have to apologize if anyone goes today where I told you I literally revamped the website today because essentially we started as just a podcast, right? Right. Um, so full transparency it was just a podcast. And like you and I kind of talked about, we've had some pretty decent traction yeah. um, and a lot of people reach out. And so now I'm in the process of structuring it where I, uh, you know, I got the course done. That was my first thing of, cause I was like, okay, I can't, I don't have time to, tell everybody step by step. So let me get a framework right. that people can go through that we've been using for the past, you know, seven years. And um, so that's done. That's on there. And then I'm essentially kind of like what you talked about, like the how to's of the things like where should I put my money? I'm essentially right now going through and writing a kind of a it's all it, it will all be free, right? It'll all be free of like how to of hey, here's where you should think of putting your your emergency fund money. It, it, these are the highest bank accounts, the best right. here's the best prepaid debit card. You know, here's the one we use. So I'm in the process of building all those resources that will be, you know, hundred percent free. And then if they want to act on it, you know, they can obviously get the course. So just the middleclassmoney.com, um, you know, just be patient with me as I have a lot of content to write, you know, trying to take everything over the past seven years, business success and failures and, and put it on there, give you the best tools that I've used and the ones that didn't work, the ones that did, um, but I'm working on that every morning at 4.30, so I'm trying to get after it. No, I think that's great. I mean, I think a lot of people um, aren't willing to 
I see this a lot actually with people that have nine to fives. They're, they're just not willing to wake up that early and yeah. get stuff done. And they always say they don't have time or whatever. They just don't prioritize their time. Uh, we all have the same 24 hours in the day. Uh, some of us just prioritize our time a little bit differently. And obviously you're willing to wake up at 4.30 in the morning to put content out there for your viewers, uh, your audience, and you're willing to make force the effort to actually do that for them. And I think that's really cool. And I think more people need to do that. And you get so much more done. I mean, no one's awake at that time. There's no distractions. I'm never, I get up at the same time. So I'm never having my uh, phone go off. I'm never having pings in my messenger. I get like a hundred messages a day. So uh, right. if I can get, uh, you know, four, uh, wake up at four and get stuff done before I get all those messages, then uh, it's super, super time saving for me. Yeah. And I'll say this to anyone that, that listens to this is is to really take a chance because I'm not a writer. Um, <laughs> and, and to be honest, I'm not a, a finance guy. I got a D in college finance. Um, yeah. But the same. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, I misspell things all the time. I don't know where commas goes. I don't know where semicolons go. And yet, and, wrote a, and yet I wrote a 30 page ebook with a step-by-step, -step, you know, course like did it take me longer than most people that can write? Yes. But, you know, don't be scared to start. And I, I read a quote the other day is like, if you're not embarrassed of your first product or first try, you know, let's say you're not selling something, your first try, then you started too late. And I look back at the first rendition of my course. It was atrocious. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure in two, three years, I'm going to look back at this rendition and be like, oh, wow. Like, I can't believe, you know, it should be so much better, right? I can't believe I didn't have this piece of content in there. Right. Um, and you're going to say that about your investment accounts. Oh my gosh, I couldn't believe, I can't believe I put it in that account. I can't believe I bought that flip. I can't believe I partnered with, you know, that Joe guy and went in and did that deal. But I promise you uh, a step forward in the right direction, even no matter how far you stumble is going to be way, you know, more promising and successful than just sitting on the sidelines. No, I, it's, that's huge. That's, I would say that's probably the biggest takeaway uh, that you could have in this uh, whole podcast is not only just budgeting, but taking the first step and uh, taking the next step and then taking the next step and being okay with failing. And then ultimately you'll get better. And your second time is going to be better than the first time. And the fifth time is going to be better than the second time. And the hundredth time is going to be better than the, the second time. So as you know, we master our craft and are able to uh, make written, uh, changes and updates and better ourselves. I mean, that's how we learn and how we grow as uh, humans and as individuals. So Tyler, thank you so much for everything. You are amazing. If you guys have not checked out Middle Class Money, they have a huge, huge following. Go ahead and subscribe right now. Go like their page, give them a five-star review. I think they're up to like 245 or so, which is amazing. So they are uh, an awesome podcast. Go check them out. And uh, Tyler, thanks so much again. And it's been a great, uh, great time talking to you. All right. Thanks, guys. All right, buddy. Bye-bye.